and um, welcome to the SPTS TBTS seminar on choosing bulls to suit your program. Um, my name is Paul Williams and I'll be the facilitator and our presenter tonight will be, I'm Paul Williams and I'm from Tropical Beef Technology Services and the presenter will be Katrina Millen from S Southern Beef Technology Services. Um, I'll just go through a bit of uh, housekeeping to start. First, um, if you have any questions, qu question box disappears, click the red arrow up the top and to get to get it back. And to ask a presenter a question, simply type your question into the questionnaire panel box and press send. If you're having any audio problems, you can use your telephone by switching to audio mode from mic and speaker to telephone and then dialing using number provided. And on that note, I'll hand you over to Katrina. Thanks, Paul. Okay, thanks everyone for um, coming on tonight. I know we had to reschedule. It was because I was sick last week and I couldn't talk for the webinar. So thank you for making the time to hop on on a different night from what was originally scheduled. So as Paul said, I'm going to talk about choosing bulls to fit your program. So this is the first of the 2016 SBTS and TBTS webinars. There's six of them in total um, and you can see them up on the screen at the moment. So you may be interested in signing up for some of those if you haven't already. So we're going to start by asking what traits do you look for when you're buying or selecting bulls? So um, to answer this question, if you want to go into your questions box and you can type in some of the things that you look for when you're buying or selecting bulls and then Paul will read them out for us. So if anyone's got anything that they, they look for, if they want to type it in now. So I don't think we've had anything. Okay, so we've got one. We've got EBVs, uh, marble score, carcass weight and birth weight. Is there anything else? Uh, fertility, calving ease, growth coming through, uh, maternal trait, EBVs. All right, so thanks everyone for typing those in. And, oh, and we've got one more come through, calving ease, structure, uh, EBVs for birth weight, 400 day weight, indexes and calving ease. So um, I guess the question we can ask ourselves is what drives production and profit? And the uh, income on the farm is the number of calves. So this comes back to our fertility traits times the weight, so our growth traits times the quality. So in this case, we're talking about our carcass traits. Less the cost of production. So we can influence all of these with genetics. So I'm hoping people have seen this equation before, P equals G plus E. And what this means is phenotype, so the way the bull looks, equals genetics, which are come from half from its sire and half from its dam, and these are set at conception. So we can't change the genetics, but it's also the way the bull looks is also influenced by the environment. So the nutrition that the bull has, the climate, the, the animals running in, um, his health and his age. So obviously in a drought situation, he's going to look a lot lighter than he would if he's got really good feed. So the way the bull looks is a combination of both his genetics or his genes and his environment. And when we're buying a breeding animal, what we're essentially doing is buying a package of genes. So we want to, to buy the best genes we can because these are going to be passed on to the progeny. And what we do with these genes is we use this variation or the difference between individuals um, to breed to improve our traits. So this is an extreme example of the variation in the different dog species where we see a really big dog and a really small dog. So there's a there's some genetic variation there. Now we see the same the same thing in, in beef or in cattle in general. We see lots of genetic variation between breeds. So we can see some with different coat colours, big ears, 
cattle that have been selected to have lots of milk production, big horns, double muscling, really tall cattle, some more colour variations and this highland one down here with lots of long hair. So we can see when we look at between the different uh, breeds of beef cattle that there's a lot of variation there. But what we also know is that there's a lot of variation within a particular breed. So I've chosen this example. This is the shorthorn breed because we can look at these ones and there's a really obvious colour difference there. But it's not just coat colour that varies within the breeds. If we look at the shorthorn genetic variation in the 2014 drop calves, these are all of the breed plan traits. And we can see that there's variation for both of our calving ease uh, traits from the top 1% in the breed down to the bottom 99% in the breed. We have this much variation. We see variation in gestation length, in our weight traits, uh, in milk, in scrotal size, days to calving, carcass weight and our carcass quality traits. So we see that not only do we have um, colour coat variation, we've also got a lot of genetic variation in all of these economically important traits. And we've used shorthorn as the example tonight, but it doesn't matter which breed I put up, I can put any of the breeds up and we would see variation in all of these economic important traits within all breeds. So the key to profitable animal breeding is to use this variation to breed the next generation. So just to reiterate, when we're, when we're buying our breeding animal or the sire of our next, next crop of calves, we're buying a package of genes. The problem is that it's really difficult to see an animal's genetics. Now, normally we do this talk um, at a, at a, on, on a property and we can go out and look at animals and we can, we can use that to demonstrate visually that it's really hard to see an animal's genetics. Um, and so I guess very few people would argue that it's that you could see the, the genetics for those hard to see traits, so things like our the level of marbling and um, the milk and the calving ease. But we've also sometimes get some people that think that they can see the growth genetics. And I guess um, when you're thinking about growth genetics, while we can see whether or not an animal is bigger than another one, we need to remember that we don't always know um, whether or not that animal, for example, is a twin. So if it's been reared as a twin, it might not be as big as an animal that's been reared as a single, even though the twin might have better growth genetics. It might look smaller because it's it's been a twin. Um, and we also, particularly at multi-vendor sales, we don't know the sort of environments those cattle are coming from. So it's it's very hard to look at an animal and see its genetic potential. So because we can't see the animal's genes, we use estimated breeding values or EBVs to get an understanding of the genetic merit of an individual. So what we've got here is a bull and we've got some EBVs. So across the top here, we've got all of the breed plan traits. We've got this individual's EBVs for each of the trait. We've got the accuracy associated with those EBVs and we've also got the breed average EBVs. Now at the moment we're in 2016 so our breed average is based on the 2014 drop and the reason it's based on the 2014 drop is because these animals are now two-year-old and they're old enough to have had things like 600 day weights recorded and also to have been scanned for a number of, of different traits. So Whenever you're looking at the breed average, it will always be for the drop born two years previously. So along here, we've got the breed average EBVs. Underneath, we've got a bit more information. We, we can see the traits that have been observed on this individual. So we can see that for this individual, gestation length, birth weight, 200 day weight, 600 day weight, and both scans, fats, and EMA have been recorded. Um, the statistics tell us the number of herds that he's got progeny in, so this is 14 herds in this case, the number of progeny analysed, the number of those progeny that have been scanned and the number of daughters he's got. So this gives us some information on the, or some, an idea of the information that's behind this animal's EBVs. So what is an EBV? As I just said, the phenotype, the way the animal looks, is a combination of his genotype and his environment. 
So what an EBV is trying to do, or what an EBV is doing, is separating the genotype from the environment and reporting just the genetic potential of that animal. So EBV stands for estimated breeding value, and how these are calculated is from pedigree and performance information supplied by stud breeders into breed plan. And it's describing the genetics of that individual independent of the environment. So at the moment, each breed is currently running a separate genetic evaluation. And what this means is that you can only compare animals within a breed. So it's fine to compare the EBVs of two simmentals, but we can't compare the EBVs of a simmental and a Charolais ind uh, individual because they're different analyses. So what I'm going to run through now is how we interpret EBVs and there's a number of things that we can do. We can compare with the breed average, we can compare with the percentiles, we need to consider our EBV accuracy and we can also compare expected differences in progeny performance. So the breed average provides an estimate of the current genetic level of the breed for each particular trait and as I said earlier they're based the breed average is for those uh, calves that are born two years previously. So if we look at this bull, we can see that his 600 day weight EBV is plus 79. The breed average EBV is plus 40. So this bull has genetics that are 39 kilograms above the current breed average for growth at 600 days of age. So looking at the breed average gives us a feel for whether or not an individual is sitting above or below breed average, but it doesn't tell us is that individual in the top 5% of the breed, is he in the top 20% of the breed. So one way we can do that is to compare with the percentiles. Now we have put the percentile table up and I realise it's a lot of numbers um, so I'm going to run through quickly how to use it and then I'm going to show you the EBV graph which gives us a visual representation of where that animal is sitting for the percentiles. So how we use it is we run along the top till we see the trait we want. In this case it's 600 day growth and then we follow it down. So we remember that the bull had a 600 day growth EBV of plus 79. So if we run it down we get to plus 72. 79 sits in between that, so therefore this bull has genetics that are in the top 5% of the breed for 600 day growth. So as I just mentioned, we've also got an EBV graph. So when you open up the EBVs for an individual animal on the web, you'll see this graph symbol up the top here. And if you click on it, it will bring up the EBV graph. So this allows us to assess where the bull is sitting or where any individual is sitting for the percentiles. So this is the same bull that I just had up before and we can see that we've got the traits down here, we've got the 50th percentile which is breed average in the middle and then we've got um, from the zero or the top percentile down to the bottom percentile and this this just gives us an idea of whether or not it's for carving ease for example this side is easier carving ease and this side is harder carving ease. So if we look at 600 day weight and we follow it down, we see that in this case the bull is in the top 5% of the breed for 600 day weight, which is what we saw by looking up the percentile table. But this just gives us an easy visual representation that we can look at all of them at once so we don't have to follow all of those columns down to find exactly where the bull's sitting. So another thing we can look at is EBV accuracy. So our accuracy provides an indication of how well the EBV is likely to estimate the true breeding value of an animal. So if we look at this bull up here, we can see he's got accuracies for all of his different traits. So for 600 day weight, his accuracy is 97%, whereas for days to calving, it's 75%. So there's some rules about what that accuracy means. If the accuracy of an EBV is less than 50%, this EBV is a preliminary estimate and it can change substantially as more performance information becomes available. So generally we'd expect to see this sort of accuracy for a young animal that's only got pedigree information, it's not old enough yet to have had its own performance recorded or to have progeny with performance recorded. 
Once we get to 50 to 74% accuracy, this is a medium accuracy. It's um, based on the animal's own records and pedigree information, but the EBVs can still change substantially as we get more information, particularly prog progeny information coming into the breed plan analysis. If the EBV has an accuracy of 75 to 90%, this is a medium high accuracy and it's starting to include some progeny information. And EBVs at this, at this level of accuracy are becoming a more reliable indicator of the animal's value as a parent. And then once we get up to an accuracy of greater than 90%, this is a high accuracy and the EBV um, is unlikely to change much even as we get more progeny data coming into the breed plan analysis. So um, we've also got an EBV standard error graph and this, this gives an indication of the possible change for each trait. So if we look at this one, we've got our, our traits down this side, we've got breed average sitting here, and we've also got the accuracy down the side. So we can look at this, this bull for calving ease direct and we see that he's plus 7.5. And that horizontal bar isn't very wide. So that's telling us that even with more information coming on uh, into the breed plan analysis, that calving ease direct EBV isn't likely to change very much. In contrast, this is a younger bull. And if we look at the calving ease direct uh, EBV, oh sorry, the accuracy first, we can see that the EBV only has a 41% accuracy. So it's at plus 3.9, but it's got this big horizontal bar around it, which means that it could move quite a bit as we get new information coming into the analysis. So um, this is giving us a good representation, a visual representation of how much those EBVs could move as we get new, new information coming into the analysis. Uh, despite this, we recommend that animals are compared on EBV regardless of accuracy um, and that's because even, even if there's a, a lower accuracy around that EBV, as we saw in this example, oh we didn't actually, sorry that was a bad one, if we look at the plus 20 for example, there's not a lot of movement or potential movement around that, that's a high accuracy EBV and the bull here is plus 20. In contrast, this one is plus 42 and there's a larger spread. But despite the fact that there's a larger spread, his EBV is not likely to move um, much, whereas the bull with a higher accuracy was down here. And so there's, there's no overlap there. And that's why we recommend that you compare animals on EBVs regardless of accuracy. However, if you've got two animals with similar EBVs, the one with higher accuracy could be the safer choice, assuming that other factors are equal. Um, generally, however, when you go to a sale that's got lots of two-year-old bulls, they're all going to have similar accuracies. Um, you're going to see higher accuracies for AI sires that are older and have a lot more progeny um, in the breed plan analysis. So the last thing we can do with our EBVs is calculate the difference in progeny from two sires. So here we've got two bulls, we've got Fred and he's got a 600 day weight EBV of plus 113 kilograms and we've got Bob who's got a 600 day weight EBV of plus 23 kilograms. So our expected difference between the progeny is half the difference in the EBV of the sires. So the difference in the 600 day weight EBVs for Fred and Bob is 90 kilograms. So we need to halve that to get how much heavier on average we expect Fred's progeny to be at 600 day weight at 600 days of age compared to Bob's. So we expect that on average Fred's progeny will be 45 kilograms heavier at 600 days compared to Bob's progeny. So have we got any questions on that that part of the the talk. So if we've got any questions you can type them in now. We've got one come in which said why are some in blue? I'm assuming, sorry, I'm assuming that was asking about these ones here. 
The reason these ABVs are in blue is because they're trait leaders for those those um, ABVs. So their trait leaders are, are highlighted in blue for that particular trait. Each breed has some different different rules about why or the different rules about what constitutes a trait leader. But in general, they're published sires. They've got to have a minimum accuracy for the trait and they've got to be in the top X percentage of the breed for the trait. But that does vary a little bit uh, between breeds. Okay, so we've had another question about what would be minimum acceptable accuracy for a trait. Um, Read plan won't report EBVs unless they hit a minimum accuracy threshold. For the majority of breeds, that's 25%, but it does vary um, by breeds. Some breeds have different minimum accuracy thresholds depending on whether or not an animal's observed, but breed plan won't report anything under 25% accuracy. Um, it's always better to have a higher accuracy EBV, but with accuracy, younger animals are always going to have lower accuracy than older, older animals just because it will be based on their pedigree, or EBVs are initially mid-parent EBVs that are based on pedigree then they get their own project, uh, their own performance recording information coming in and that lifts their accuracy again. And then as they get progeny, their ABV accuracy increases. So we won't, we won't report anything less than 25%. Um, and if in doubt, go for the higher accuracy animal, but we would still say compare compare animals on EBVs, but if you don't want to risk those EBVs moving, look for those high accuracy animals. Um, we've had another couple of questions come in. So how common is it for a bull to be good for calving east traits but be high for birth weight? I'm going to talk about heifer bulls a little bit later in the talk, but we can see bulls that have good calving ease EBVs or above average calving ease EBVs and still have an above average birth weight. It's not as common because the relationship is generally that a lower birth weight EBV is uh, correlated with higher birth weight EBV is correlated with harder calving ease. Um, but the calving ease traits are take, taking into account things like shape. So yes, occasionally we will see bulls that have above average calving ease EBVs and also um, higher than average birth weight EBVs. I can't give you an answer on exactly how common that is though, but it, it would be not expected because it's the relationship is not the one that we we expect to see very often we've had another question how much of the growth ebv is driven by birth weight and or mature weights so the growth ebvs are correlated, um, so birth weight is correlated with growth, which is correlated with mature weight. Um, to identify a curve bender bull, so those bulls which have low birth weight EBVs, high growth EBVs, and also low mature cow weight EBVs, um, because because those traits are related, the only way we're ever going to identify a curve bender is to record birth weight and to re record mature cow weight. Because if, if there's no birth weight information in the breed plan analysis and there's no mature cow weight information in the breed plan analysis, the analysis knows that those traits are highly correlated with growth and it assumes, unless it's told otherwise, that high growth equals high birth weight and high mature cow weight. I'm not sure if that's quite answered the question. Um, 
Um, and just a follow on talking about EBV accuracy. So if an EBV was high with low accuracy caution needed, um, just an awareness that the EBV can move. So uh, we won't talk about it in this in this presentation, but um, think of it as spreading the risk. If you've got a a group of bulls with a low accuracy, a, lo a group of young bulls with low accuracies, if you take a team of bulls, their EBVs might re-rank, but generally they'll all, their average will remain the same. Whereas if you take the top bull and just the top bull, he might re-rank and become the fifth bull. So using EBVs, um, if they're low accuracy, try and spread the risk if you can. And if you really want high accuracy, look at your AI sires. Another question, for calving ease selection, are the calving ease EBVs more use, useful than birth weight? Um, the calving ease EBVs are a combination of calving difficulty score information that's sent in by breeders, uh, gestation length information and birth weight. So what, what they're trying to do is to get all that information about shape and willingness of the cow to push and put that into the EBV. So yes, I think um, using a calving ease EBV will give you more information. Birth weight is an indication. We expect that a higher birth weight can be correlated with lower calving ease. But I would I would be looking at the birth uh, the, sorry the calving ease EBVs in conjunction with birth weight EBVs. So our next question is what brings in a higher accuracy, EBV accuracy result, a trait measured off the animal or measured off the progeny? Um, if we've got lots of progeny measurements, that's multiple pieces of information. So the EBV accuracy, think of it of, as being how much information is behind that EBV. So if you've just got one measurement on the animal, we've just got one bit of information. Whereas if you've read, measured 10 progeny for that trait, that's 10 bits of information. So um, that's that's the reason why once you start with, you start with a mid-parent, then you get one, one piece of information on the animal itself. And then the EBV lifts again when you get multiple bits of information on the progeny. So, uh, Lots of progeny measurements give us lots more bits of information. Does a calf that is physically weighed at birth have a higher accuracy EBV um, compared to one that wasn't weighed at birth? Generally, I would expect so. However, it also depends on how much pedigree information is behind behind that animal. So if the same amount of pedigree information was behind both animals, then yes, I would expect the one that was weighed at birth to have a higher accuracy EBV for birth weight. However, if it was from a herd that was not heavily recorded historically, um, it may not. EBV accuracy is a combination of the amount of pedigree information, the um, heritability of the trait, and also the information that we've got on those different, on, on the actual animal. So generally, but not necessarily, which, and I've skipped one more question. I'm just going to go up and find it. Um, the question was how important is gestation length and I guess that that depends on your your uh, breeding objectives. Um, I'm going to talk about gestation length in relation to heifer bulls a bit later in the talk so hopefully that will will help to answer the question. Uh, 
And the last question I've got is, what importance should we place on carving his daughter's EBV? Um, once again, that's going to depend on your, your breeding objectives and what you're trying to do. If you're in a self-replacing herd, um, the carving ease daughter's EBV is of importance because it's it's telling us um, the, the likelihood of a bull's daughters having having trouble carving as two-year-old heifers. Um, if you're in a terminal system where you're not keeping those those daughters, uh, it may not be such an important trait to you because you're not keeping the daughters. Uh, and then the last question is, any correlation with birth weight and gestation length? Yes, there is. In general, we expect a lower gestation, a shorter gestation length to be correlated with a lower birth weight. Okay, so thanks for all the questions. Um, I'm going to move on with the next part of the talk. So we've just been through that we've got lots of EBVs, but what is the problem with just selecting bulls on a single trait? So as we've alluded to in the questions, a lot of these, or the majority of these traits are related. So there's correlations between all of the different traits and selecting on a single trait ignores those relationships. And if we put selection pressure on one trait without considering what that's going to do to the other traits, it can cause those other traits to move in an unfavorable direction. So one example of that is if we drive growth by selecting on 600 day weight alone. So in this example, we see the breed average EBV for growth is plus 40 and this bull has a 600 day weight EBV of plus 102, so he's well above breed average. So if we just selected for 600 day weight, in general, we would see a decrease in calving ease, an increase in birth weight, and an increase in mature cow weight. So this then leads us to the question, we need to think about all of these different traits in conjunction with each other. So how much emphasis should we put on each trait? And so um, a lot of the breeds have developed selection indexes. And so this is our same bull that we were looking at earlier. So we've got all of his EBVs and we've also got his selection index values. Now, Simmental have four, four selection indexes and his index values are down here. So what our selection indexes are doing is providing a simple solution to a complex problem. So they're taking that hard work out of knowing how much emphasis we should give to different traits when selecting bulls to improve herd profitability. And they're <coughs> excuse me, providing an EBV for profit for a specific production to market scenario. So a lot of the breeds have developed selection indexes. Um, so we can see here that Angus, Hereford, Shorthorn, Murray Gray, Brahman, Charolais, Santa, Simi, Limo, Red Angus, South Devon, Wagyu, Brangus and Belmont all have uh, selection indexes available. Most breeds have more than one selection index. Um, the ex the exem exemption is Wagyu, which just has their full blood terminal index. Um, and we can see that a lot of them have similar names. So we've got a domestic index in Angus and a supermarket index in Hereford. So these indexes are targeting that domestic or supermarket uh, market, uh, market. And we can see that some of them are maternal. So they're generally um, indicating that that's a self-replacing herd system, while some of them are terminal. So in that case, all of those progeny are, are being sold um, and so they're not keeping daughters in this system. So when we use selection indexes, um, what we need to do is select the index that's most relevant to you. So you will know what your breeding objectives are, what market you're breeding for. And so you can look at the breed, breed society selection indexes and select that one that's most relevant to you. You can then rank animals on that index, whether or not that's a list of um, AI sires that are available or young animals for sale. We then need to consider individual EBVs and then we can also compare expected difference in progeny profitability. So I'm going to run through a Brahmin example. 
So there's two Brahman selection indexes, JAPOX index and Live Export index. And in this case, selecting the index of most relevance, um, we're going to say that the JAPOX index is the most relevant index in this situation. So the next thing we can do is rank animals on index. So this is the Brahman um, published sires and I've ranked them on index. So as we can see here. Um, as with EBVs, we've got percentiles available for each of the indexes. So you can see exactly where the bulls are sitting for that particular index or you can look at the EBV graph which will give you that visual representation of where they're sitting. Um, and then we need to consider individual EBV. So in this situation, we've got six bulls that have a Japanese ox index of plus 61. So they've got the same selection index value, but they've got different component EBVs. So if we have a look here, we can see that birth weight EBVs range from plus 1.4 to plus 4.2. If we look at 600 day weight EBVs, we can see that they're ranging from plus 40 to plus 65. If we look at days to calving, we can see that they're, they're ranging from negative 7.2 days to negative 14.6 days. And if we look at eye muscle area, we can see that that's ranging from negative 0.1 square centimetres up to plus 3 square centimetres. So even though these animals have the same index value, because each index is made up of different um, components, these components can vary. So we need to set minimum and maximum EBV ranges for traits of particular importance. So do your initial sort on your index and then make sure if you've got certain uh, traits that are particularly important to your breeding objectives that you put some rules around um, those minimum and maximum EBVs for those traits. And then the last thing we can do is interpret our selection indexes and calculate the difference in value of progeny from two sires. So once again, we're back with uh, Fred and Bob and we can see that Fred has a supermarket index of $88 and Bob has a supermarket index of $9. So the expected difference in output is half the difference in the index of sires. The difference between Fred and Bob is $79. So we expect Fred's progeny to be $39.50 per cow mated more profitable compared to Bob's progeny. And if we consider that we might join these two bulls to 200 cows over their breeding life, this equates to 200 times $39.50, which is $7,900 difference for this production system. So have we got any questions on selection indexes? So if you've got any questions, you can type them into the question box again. I'll give everyone a minute or two and then we'll move on to the next, the next uh, part of the talk. So we've got one question come through. When the physical market moves and the index is no longer relevant, how do you interpret the index? Um, so the indexes are looked at periodically and I, I guess if you're, you're concerned that they're no longer relevant to what you as a, a breeder are trying to do, then um, the breed societies would look at them from time to time and update them. Um, obviously, we don't we don't want to update them every time the breed plan analysis is run because um, and there's certain considerations as to when we should update indexes. 
but um, they they have been filled out based on a certain uh, there's a a breed object uh, questionnaire that asks lots of questions about say for example the level of carving difficulty in the in the particular situation um, the prices that things are getting f being being uh, assigned so yes they could be periodically updated um, I guess at the moment the the prices here where it was a difference of $39.50 these would have been calculated at old prices so um, the other thing to remember too as the beef market's gone up, the price difference is probably bigger than what we're seeing here. Um, we've got another question. The EBVs are based on pasture fed. So some of the indexes are based on pasture fed situations. So for example, this grass fed steer index that Hereford have, that's based on animals being uh, finished on pasture. Um, but as you can see, we've also got some grain fed indexes. So they're based on the animals being finished on grain. And yep, that's a, a good point too. Regardless of the market price today, the indices remain relative. They do. Um, the only thing is that the spread might be bigger as the price differential um, increases. Okay, so I'm going to move on with the next part of the talk. So... We're going to talk about choosing a bull for a specific program and I'm going to use a Hereford example. So the scenario is we're buying a heifer bull for a producer targeting the domestic market. So I'm hoping this is going to work. Um, the question is, is this a heifer bull? So a poll should have popped up on your um, screen so if you can answer the, the question Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple more seconds and then I'm going to close the poll. Okay, so I'm closing the poll. So we had 33% say yes, it is a heifer bull, 20% say no, it's not, and 47% not sure. So this one... I wouldn't classify as a heifer bull. When we're, when we're looking for a heifer bull, we want something that's going to have um, easy carving. Uh, and if we look at this bull, we can see that he's got a harder carving ease direct and carving ease daughters. He's got a longer than average uh, gestation length and also he's much heavier than breed average for birth weight. So I would say that um, this bull potentially uh, heifers – being joined to this bull could have um, issues carving, so I wouldn't classify this bull as a heifer bull. So next question, is this bull a heifer bull? So if we look at, sorry, if we look at this one, we can see that he's well above breed average for carving his direct and carving his daughters. He's got a shorter gestation length and his birth weight is uh, lighter than breed average. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple more seconds. All right, so closing the poll, we have 88% say yes, this is a heifer bull, 6% no, and 6% not sure. So the majority of you are correct. I would classify this bull as a heifer bull. So what traits are important in a heifer bull? 
birth weight. So as we talked about earlier, um, generally a lighter birth weight is correlated with less calving difficulty. Gestation length, a shorter gestation length generally means a lower birth weight calf, which we want when we're, we're trying to get live, live calves out of a heifer. Um, calving ease direct and also calving ease daughters in a self-replacing herd situation. So our birth weight EBVs are estimates of the genetic difference between animals for birth weight and smaller, more moderate birth weight EBVs are more favourable and indicate lighter birth weights. Our gestation length EBV provides an estimate of the genetic difference between animals in gestation length and these are expressed in days and lower or more negative gestation length EBVs are considered more favourable as these indicate shorter gestation length. Carving ease direct EBVs are estimates of genetic differences in the ability of a size calves to be born unassisted from two-year-old heifers. <coughs> Excuse me. And calving ease direct EBVs are reported as differences in the percentage of unassisted calvings. So higher, more positive calving ease direct EBVs are more favourable. Um, calving ease daughters. Uh, this is important in a self-replacing herd situation. So calving ease daughters EBVs are estimates of genetic differences in the ability of a size two-year-old daughters to carve without assistance. And these are also reported as differences in percentage of unassisted carvings and higher, more positive calving ease daughter EBVs are more favourable. So the problem is that while low birth weight EBVs should reduce the likelihood of calving difficulties, they're also usually correlated with low growth. So this bull here is a good example of this. We can see his birth weight EBV is in the top 10 top 10 percent of the breed so he's much his birth weight EBV is much lighter than breed average but if we look at his 200 day growth 400 day growth and 600 day growth we can see that for 200 day growth he's in the bottom 95 percent of the breed for 200 day growth and for four and 600 he's in the bottom 88th nearly 90th percentile for 400 and 600 day weight. So while those calves are going to be small, uh, have light birth weights, they're also not going to have a lot of growth. So the solution is to identify curve benders. So when I talk about a curve bender, I'm talking about a bull that is bucking those trends. So in this case, we can see that birth weight is below breed average. So this bull is in the top, sorry, the birth weight is lighter than breed average and he's in the top 10% of the breed for birth weight, so lighter birth weight. But at the same time, his growth for 200-day weight is in the top 10% of the breed, his growth for 400-day weight is in the top 10% of the breed and his growth for 600-day weight is in the top 25% of the breed. So this bull has broken that trend. His low a lighter birth weight hasn't stopped him from having higher than average growth. So this is the sort of thing we want to be looking for, a bull that's got this low birth weight but also really good growth genetics. Um, and the second problem is that it can be difficult to balance calving ease direct and calving ease daughters. So this bull here is a classic example of that. Uh, he's got a calving ease direct, which is easier um, in the top 10% of the breed, but his calving ease daughters is in the bottom 95th percentile of the breed. So what we need to do is once again identify a curve bender. So those bulls that are above breed average for calving ease direct and calving ease daughters. And we can see that this bull here is a classic example of that. So our scenario 
was buying a heifer bull for a, produ for a producer targeting the domestic market. So if we go back um, to our, our situation, we're remembering that it's a Hereford um, example, we need to identify the most relevant selection index. Now there's four four select Hereford selection indexes, supermarket index, grass-fed steer index, grain-fed steer index and EU index. So in this case, we're targeting the domestic market. So the supermarket index is going to be the most relevant in this situation. So what we need to do now is sort bulls by selection index. So we're going to sort the bulls that are available for sale by supermarket index. So to do this, I've opened the Hereford Animal Inquiry and you can see up the top that we've got these sale catalogues. So we're going to go into the sale catalogue and we're going to go into completed sale catalogues, but you could also search um, current sale catalogues if you wanted to. And we're going to open up the Waruna sale catalogue. So we can see that there's 68 entries in this sale. And if we click up here, we can search and sort catalogue. So we're going to click on that and then we can scroll down so we're only interested in bulls, so we're going to select animal is male. And down here, which we'll do in a minute, we can put some minimum and maximum values around EBVs. But what we're going to do down here, there's a sort by option. So we're going to say sort by supermarket index and make it descending. So what this does, is it brings up 54 bulls that are for sale in this sale catalogue and they're currently sorted by supermarket index. So we can click show all entries and that will bring all 54 of them up. And we can see that they start from plus 146 and if we scroll down uh, to plus 77, so they're all above uh, breed average for supermarket index. So that's our first step. Our second step is that we're going to set some minimum and maximum EBVs for traits of importance. So in this case, I've decided to put calving ease direct. So we're going to specify that we want something in the top 30% of the breed for calving ease direct. Uh, it's a self-replacing system, so we want calving ease daughters um, as well. So we're going to say they need to be in the top 30% of the breed for that. Gestation length, top 30% of the breed. Birth weight, top 50 and 400 day weight, top 30. So just because we want good calving ease direct and daughters, uh, good gestation length and a, a birth weight of breed average or lower, doesn't mean that we want to compromise on growth. So we're going to put this growth specification in as well. So if we go back to our search, so search sort catalog again, make sure that we select animal is male. And we can find the top 30 percentile by clicking down here on click for percentiles. So if we go across, we see that for carving ease direct, top 30 is plus 1.7. For carving ease daughters, top 30 is plus 2.1. For gestation length, top 30 is negative 0.7. Top 50 for birth weight is 4.5. And the top 30 for 400 day weight is plus 53. So if we go back, we can fill these in here. So we can say we want our minimum carving ease direct EBV to be 1.7. Our minimum carving ease daughter's EBV to be plus 2.1. Our maximum gestation length to be 0 0.7. Our maximum birth weight to be 4.5 and our minimum 400 day weight to be plus 53. And we want to sort once more by supermarket index. So we click search. So previously we had 54 bulls for sale. Now we've got 13 and we can see them listed here. So if you know what you're after in a particular situation, and what your breeding objectives are, you can do exactly what I've done to search um, and sort the catalogue. So very, very quickly, just by putting in some minimum maximums for particular uh, EBVs that we're interested in, we've we've got a list gone. Sorry, we've we've 
narrowed the sale catalogue from 54 bulls that suit the situation we're after down to 13. And so what we can do then is print this list out and then on sale day, you can walk around and start uh, looking at bulls for structure and um, things like that. So it's a really good way of quickly sorting through a large sale catalogue to find those bulls that suit the particular situation that you're, you're after. So, oh, and the other thing we can do is we can open the, the top one, for example, and have a look at his, his graph. So you can do that for all of these, these, uh, these bulls. Okay, so as I just said, we've, we've narrowed our, our catalogue, we've narrowed the catalogue and selected those bulls that are for sale that are suiting our particular situation. Um, and then what we need to do is consider our other traits of importance. So pedigree, is the animal closely related to your herd? Is inbreeding going to be a problem? On sale day, you can walk around and assess structural soundness. Is the animal sound? Can he walk? Um, also look at fertility. So has he had a bull breeding soundness examination done? And are the results available? And also does he have any genetic genetic condition? So is he carrying any genetic conditions? If you're in a a uh, breed that has both horn and pole, you might be interested in horn pole status. So you can look to see whether or not he's had a genetic test done for horn pole status. Um, and so what we're recommending is that you identify which selection index is aligned with your own breeding objectives and you use it to do an initial sort and that you can put emphasis on individual traits but do so in conjunction with a selected in selection index to avoid unexpected outcomes. So as we discussed before, if you put selection pressure on just one trait, it can cause um, uh, negative outcomes in other traits. So you need to think about all of those traits together rather than just focusing on one. Um, and the other thing is that structural soundness and fertility matter. So even if he's got the best EBVs in the world, if he's not structurally sound, if he's not fertile and he's not going to get those cows pregnant, he's no good. So um, on before going to a sale, you can do your, your initial sort, um, get all a, a list of those bulls that have the, the ABVs and the indexes that you're after for your particular breeding objective. And then make sure you go around and look at the bulls on sale day and, and check their structure um, and their, their fertility. So have we got any questions on that part of the talk? Okay, if there's no questions, the last thing that I wanted to go through is show everyone how you can search the animals that are for sale. Um, so there's two things we can do. We can search an individual sale catalogue to identify animals of interest at a particular sale, or we can search all animals that are currently listed for sale in the breed. <laughs> So I've just shown you how to search an individual catalogue, but what you need to do is select the sale catalogue you wish to search, select that search sort catalogue from the top left hand corner, and then you can enter your search criteria. So if we look back here, we select a sale catalogue, and we click on the search sort catalogue up the top, and that allows us to put in some minimum and maximums for any of the traits that we're interested in and also for our indexes. You can also um, select on a number of different things. So animal is male, status for genetic conditions and use that when you're searching an individual sale catalogue. The other thing you can do is search all animals that are currently for sale. So to do this, you need to go to the EBV search page and some breed societies have a listing type 
and some have a select diff box. So just to show everyone that again, if we go to EBV inquiry in Hereford, we can see that they've got an option here currently listed for sale. So we could use that to select all animals that are currently listed for sale. Um, you can select if you want males or females. Um, depending on where you're located, you can also select where those animals are located. So you might only be interested in searching for animals in New South Wales, in Tasmania, in Western Australia. So you can, you can put those in as well and then once again put your minimum and maximum uh, EBV criteria in. In other breeds, if we go to EBV inquiry, you'll see there's no select if for sale button, but if you go down to select if, click on this, and there's an option here, animal is for sale. So that will allow you to search all animals for sale within that breed. So that's how you, <coughs> excuse me, that's how you search all animals for sale. So now I'm gonna talk about how we can find AI sires. So once again, there's two ways. You can search an individual semen catalog to identify those animals of interest, or you can search all animals in the breed with semen available. So searching an AI catalog, it's very similar to searching a for sale catalog. Select the semen catalog you wish to search. Select search sort catalog from the top left corner and enter your search criteria. So if we go back to Hereford, We'll click on semen catalogs up the top and we can we can search a particular sale catalog here so um, once again we can put in our minimums and maximums to find our heifer bull so 1.7 2.1 3.5 maximum birth weight of 4.5 and a minimum 400 day weight of 53 kilos. Search by super, uh, sort by supermarket index again and click search. And that brings up the five, five bulls in that semen catalog that uh, meet that criteria that we've put in. So that's how you search an individual semen catalog. And once again, you can also search all AI sires that are available within the breed. And as as we just looked, uh, as we just saw when we were searching for individual animals, some breed societies have a listing type, some breed societies have a selective box. So if we go back to Hereford, we can click here, listed in semen catalog, and then put in the criteria that we want. If we look at Brahmin, we click on this select if, and there's an option There was an option this afternoon. Ah. It might just because there's only one, but there should be should be an option uh, to select a semen or animal with semen available in one of these boxes, which might not be showing up because there's only one semen catalogue. We'll have a look at that, but that is where you would look for it in those in those breeds that don't have um, the the listing type across the top. Um, and lastly, occasionally you will see an error message like this. So in this situation, um, I asked, or I searched for an, a male that was currently listed for sale that had the top calving ease direct value in the breed, the top calving ease daughter's value in the breed, the top 400 day weight um, value in the breed, and also the top supermarket index in the breed. And it's said that animal doesn't exist and it's come up with an error message. So if you're searching the entire list of animals for sale, you can readjust your parameters and search again. If you are searching an individual sale catalogue, you can expand your search to see if any other producer has an animal that fits your criteria and see what it brings up. But in general, if you see this error message, 
you're going to need to go back and adjust your selection criteria till you find an animal that actually exists. So if you've got any further information, you can contact your technical officers for your breed. So Alex McDonald is the technical officer for Limousin and Simmental. Um, Carl is the technical officer for Wagyu. And I've got the rest of the Southern, uh, the breed societies involved in Southern Beef Technology Services. So Blonde, Charolais, Devon, Hereford, Murray Gray, Red Angus, Red Pole, Solaire's, Shorthorn and Speckle Park. And Paul is the TBTS technical officer, so Belmont, Brahman, Brangus, Shabray, Droughtmaster, Santa and Senapol. Um, if you are interested in registering for the rest of the 2016 SBTS and TBTS webinars, um, they're coming up over the next couple of months. So the second webinar is Getting It Right, Management Groups and Contemporary Groups, and that will be next week on Monday the 26th of September. Webinar three is Making Breed Plan Work For You, Performance Recording Problems To Avoid. That's on Monday 10th of October. Webinar four, Fertility Matters, Recording Fertility Information With Breed Plan on Monday the 24th of October. Webinar five will be Collecting Abattoir Carcass Information For Breed Plan on Monday 31st of October. And the final webinar for the 2016 um, webinar series is Where To With Genomics, which will be on Monday 14th of November 2016. Have we got any questions? Uh, so we've got one question. Will all sires listed in an AI catalogue have semen available? Yes, they should. Um, yeah, so anything in the AI catalogue should have semen available. Um, one thing to remember is that obviously the sales and the, the AI size have to be listed in the, the search areas for you to be able to find them. So if they're not listed there, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to, to bring them up in the search. Um, in commercial herds, how closely related can be tolerated? Um, different different people have different opinions on what level of inbreeding is okay. Um, if the entire herd had an inbreeding coefficient of around 10%, um, we'd be saying to you, look, they're, they're quite closely related, this might be something you want to keep an eye on. Um, but within any herd, there will be, there will usually be animals that are, have an inbreeding coefficient higher than that. But so long as the herd overall isn't up at the 10% or higher, I wouldn't be particularly concerned. Um, the next question is, can people go back and see a record, recording of this webinar later? Yes, um, it's being recorded and it will be up on YouTube tomorrow. And uh, tomorrow you'll get a follow-up email and I'll put the link in there so that you can go and view that. Uh, you've got access to the link of where the webinar recording is. What's the most suitable index for a grass-fed Angus operation selling to feedlots? Um, the, the one thing I didn't talk about is where to find the information for your breed on that describes the indexes. So if we go to the breed plan website, you can go to technical and click on breed plan tip sheets. If you scroll down, there's an Interpreting Australian Selection Indexes uh, tip sheet for all of the breeds that have them. So um, this will give you a, a description of all, all of the indexes for your particular breed. Um, I don't know the Angus indexes particularly well, but I would think for a grass-fed situation, Uh, 
you would be maybe looking at the domestic or the, the grass-fed index. Um, we've got another question on, are overseas AI, SIA, EBVs or similar data able to be included in assessments with any reliability? Um, some breeds include the overseas information in the breed plan analysis. Um, that's usually imported several times a year. It's not imported for every run. Um, So, yes, um, some breeds are including that overseas information. For other breeds, um, no overseas information is included. And so that means that overseas sires can start with, with quite low accuracy um, for those EBVs until they start to have progeny in Australia. All right. Well, if there's no more no more questions, we might um, finish the webinar there. Um, thank you for to everyone for for coming up uh, for coming on. And um, yeah, um, after the the webinar finishes, there will be a survey. So we would really appreciate it if you could take the time to to fill in the survey. And we have run a little bit over time, so I'll close the webinar in a minute and let you all all go. So thank you once again for coming on tonight.